I have a puppy. No. Oh, come on. We belong together. No, I belong with my one true love, Lupa. I would rather drink a bucket of nails than go out with you, you weirdo. Ugh, yes, you'll get slapped if you're looking hoe. <laughs> Todd, do you ever think that your standards are too high? You know, you could give love a chance. We belong together. It would be the greatest love story ever written for the internet. No, it won't. No one writes love stories that start with someone lowering their standards. Think, have you ever heard a love song that goes like this? You're passable. You're passable. You're passable, it's true. Saw your face. It's okay. So I figured that you will do. Till I find somebody new. You're so talented. <laughs> yeah, I know, that was pretty awesome. Although that gives me an idea. You know, we have songs in this world all about different subjects, but if there is one thing that has fascinated the great poets and writers, and especially the singers and musicians of the world, it is love. Love is a many splendid thing. What? Love lifts us up where we belong. All you need is love. You'd think that people would have had enough of silly love songs. I look around me and I see it isn't so. And love has so very many facets of it. Love lifts us up where we belong. You get songs of passion, songs of loneliness, songs of jealousy, songs of sadness and of heartbreak, of rage, of lust, of loss, of joy, of pain. People in love with love, people who hate love. And because of this, it is one of the most difficult topics in the world to say something new about. Songwriters have explored the highest joys of love, as well as its deepest sadnesses, its most poignant ends, and its bitterest heartbreaks. But there's one emotion that I have found sadly underexplored. And that emotion is... Meh. Songwriters like big emotions, not dull ones, but that's a part of life. So, this is my tribute to the few love songs out there about the mundane, the unromantic, the unpassionate, the dull. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you... Your sort of everything I ever wanted. The top 10 songs about mediocre romance. Number 10. Guten Morgen, begets, bonasir, shalom. Aloha, ciao, bonasir. Do you believe in love? Do you believe in love? Do you believe in love? Huey Lewis believes in love. He believes in the power of love. He believes in love so much, he can be charming and love struck, even in boring love affairs. I don't suppose you want to take a ride on my yacht. Oh, Huey Lewis, I'd go anywhere with you. At first, I wasn't going to put this one on the list because I figured it didn't count. I thought it wasn't actually about being in a mediocre relationship. It was about genuinely being in love. Yes, it's true. And all that stuff about being stuck with each other is just a silly, corny joke. Like the kind old people tell because they're so comfortable with each other. You know, gosh, honey, I'd be too difficult to break up. I guess I'm stuck with you. It, it's, it's, it's sweet, right? I mean, listen to this guy. He's so happy. And then I realized it's Huey Lewis. Of course he's happy! What is he not happy? Of course he's pleased with his burnt out, past its sell by date, boring relationship. He's a boring guy! He's thrilled as heck that it would be too inconvenient to break up at this point. All the same friends and the same 
And he's being absolutely serious that they're not breaking up because they have too many mutual friends and moving out is a pain. And moreover, he's thrilled about it. The more I think about it, I don't know why I could have imagined he was joking. I don't think Huey Lewis is even capable of sarcasm. God bless you, Huey Lewis. Your unflagging cheeriness is an inspiration to us all. Well, not really, but you're good enough for now. Number nine. Singing his solid gold classic, Escape, the Pina Colada song, please welcome Mr. Rupert Holmes. <laughs> Let me make it clear, I absolutely loathe this song. Rupert Holmes was a really, really bad yacht rocker who hit number one in 1979 with Escape the Pina Colada Song, an unlistenably bad joke song that I have no idea how it got popular. I was tired of my lady, we've been together too long. For the unfamiliar, the story of the Pina Colada Song is that the narrator decides to cheat on his wife because he's bored and an asshole. So he answers some skeezy Craigslist personal ad that's looking for a guy who likes pina coladas and other stupid crap. Then he meets this mystery woman who likes pina coladas and getting caught in the rain, and turns out it's his wife! <laughs> yuck, yuck, yuck. It was my own lovely lady. <laughs> what a wacky scenario, only imaginable by anyone who's seen a sitcom or a bad chick flick in the past 30 years. Answering a personal ad, don't you know that only twisted weirdos place those things? <laughs> well, I do now! It's a stupid joke punchline of a song, but I always wondered what this says about the couple Holmes is describing. They both casually go looking for some strange, but when they seek out some new mystery lover, they end up describing their own spouses. I never met you like me, How could they have reached the bored stage of their relationship without knowing all this crap about each other? What's even the point of cheating if you're looking for someone exactly like your current SO? This couple's so bad at romance they can't even cheat properly. And then the song just ends, and, and then what happens? Then we laugh for a moment. They both just kind of chuckle like, oh, you rascal, instead of diving for a phone book to start looking up divorce lawyers. I have to imagine they just go back to their unfulfilling sex life and try to plan their infidelities more carefully. And that's assuming, of course, that the flame of passion isn't somehow reignited by their newly discovered mutual love of pina coladas. There are admittedly worse things to base a relationship around. We'll get to that. And it was smile in an instant. And I guess at the end that this awful couple learned that they were meant to be miserable. Ah, they deserve each other. This song can bite me. Come with me in the escape. Well, not really, but you're good enough for now. Number eight. She can kill with a smile. She can wound with her eyes. She you know what? It's my list. I'm gonna count it. For this list, I am choosing Billy Joel's single most beloved love song, after Uptown Girl. And Just The Way You Are. And She's Got Away. And The Longest Time. God, he's got a lot of songs. But like I said, it's my list. And I say this is a love song for an awkward, unhappy relationship. And here's my basis for this. It is a love song in which the singer says absolutely nothing nice about the woman he's in love with. She can ruin your faith with her casual lies. And she'll carelessly cut you and laugh while you bleed. Gotta admit, the way Billy sings about her, she seems like a real bitch. It's just such a bitter, miserable song. And then he wipes it all away because, quote, she's always a woman to me. She steals like a thief, but she's always a woman. That is a vague statement of praise at best. I found that most women are always a woman. Honestly, if she wasn't always a woman to you, I'd be more impressed. But she'll bring out the best and the worst you can be. Yes, even the compliment comes with an insult. She can ask for the truth, but she never believe you. I purposely chose not to include songs about bitterness or contempt for the supposed object of love because there are a lot of those. But I made an exception for this song because of the way I think Billy Joel intended it to be a genuine love song. and That's what makes this song kind of fascinating to me. He wants to sound romantic and in love, but he just sounds so pissed. It's not even an I hate how much I love you song. It comes across as like, I'm in love with you, I guess. And always a bitch too. Next! Well not really, 
but you're good enough for now. Number seven. The thing that R.E.M. got tagged with in the 80s is that it was hard to tell what lead singer Michael Stipe was singing about. And in some cases, that was because Stipe was singing too fast. Blood, Leonard, Blood, Leonard, 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 Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein. Other times, he slurred his lyrics so much you could barely make out a single word. And other times, you could tell what he was saying, but you didn't know what it meant. Um, good to know, Mike. But of all the alternative hits they had before their mega mainstream breakthrough in the early 90s, there's one which I think I understand pretty well. Now, granted, the one I love doesn't provide a lot of details. Of course, there's only one unexplained word. Still, I think I get the gist of it. A simple prop to occupy simple prop to occupy my time is not that hard to interpret. I'm guessing the phrase, this one goes out to the one I love, is sarcastic. And I don't think this is a song you want playing at your wedding is all I'm saying. Unless your wedding has somehow caught fire and you need to let everyone know. Fire! Granted, the fact that the chorus is stipe screaming fire might indicate that there is some kind of passion involved. Maybe he just sets the ones he loves on fire after he leaves them behind, I don't know. Another Hey, another fun fact about the song, R.E.M. is awesome. That is all. Well, not really, but you're good enough for now. Number six. Ladies and gentlemen, Pearl Jam. <laughs> By 1994, Pearl Jam had effectively decided that they were too good to be popular. They refused to promote their songs by releasing music videos because they were all, like, totally offended that MTV actually played music. Oh, how times change. And they canceled an entire summer tour in protest of Ticketmaster, and also they released an album which had this song on it. Bugs in my bed. Bugs in my ears. And this one. This goes on for nearly eight minutes. So, if Pearl Jam were starting to build up a reputation for being a little up their own butts, I hope it's clear why. But, as a counterpoint to that, they've shown themselves willing to be remarkably unpretentious in their subject matter, and I've always admired the way they were willing to write about people who were not themselves, because most of the major rock bands of the 90s did not write character songs. You weren't going to see Bush write Jeremy, and Collective Soul wasn't going to record Daughter. If there's another 90s band who recorded this song, I'd like to know who. Actually, Pearl Jam almost didn't record this song either. It wasn't even released as a single, and Vetter reportedly didn't even want to make it because it was, quote, too commercial. She lies and says she's in love with him. Anyway, it's one of the most depressingly real, almost country music-ish songs in the Pearl Jam oeuvre. About a sad, sad woman who has decided she can't do better than the asshole she's with. Better never exactly says what this useless man is out doing at 4am. Drinking? Cheating? Being a member of Creed? <laughs> Whatever it is, he's clearly a dick, which makes her decision to just give up rather than say all the things she's dying to say all the more heartbreaking. It's really sad. Everybody sing! She can't find a better man! Yeah! Can we move on? Number five. Yeah, that last song was a little depressing. Gotta admit, it brought me down a little. I need to be cheered up, but 
I'm so alone here. Steven Stills, what should I do? Yep, that's me. Well, I'm talking to you, but go on. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. That's clever. And kind of awful. This is a song that could only be written in the days of free love hippiedom when sex could just be handed out like toothpicks. She's bored, you're lonely, do I have to spell it out for you dude? Now depending on your interpretation this could be a song about either settling for less or it could also be about cheating on your girl while she's out of town. Either way, Steven Stills gives out some terrible advice. Maybe it's about not wasting your time with some tramp who's not available and learning to be happy with the awesome, wonderful, clever girl who's right in front of you! Yeah, I know! Isn't that horrible? But it's so cheery. It just puts the nicest spin on cheating slash settling. Yeah, the eagle flies with the dove, and I'm guessing not to eat it. Oh, he's gonna have sex with that dove, because he can't find any other eagles. Don't judge him. Steven Stills told him to do it. Well, not really, but you're good enough for now. Number four. Now, what do these songs all have in common? They're all about boring relationships. Well, I know what you swingers out there are thinking. You're thinking the problem is the relationship part of it. No wonder they're bored. Everyone gets bored after a while. And the solution is to have hot, steamy sex with a different guy or girl every night. You'll never have a subpar romantic experience again. Well, allow me to provide a rebuttal. This song was originally performed in 1975 by the Amazing Rhythm Aces, a band that I will never ever stop confusing with the Atlanta Rhythm Section till the day I die. But I couldn't find any clips of the original, so we're looking at the 90s cover version done by country singer Sammy Kershaw, which I know better anyway. Now, unlike the other songs on this list, we're dealing with a guy picking up a chick at the bar for a one-night stand, which makes it unique on this list. But this isn't a third-rate romance because these two people aren't going to get married and have kids. No, it's third-rate because it's a one-night stand that's just not very good. Like when people usually sing about a single night of passion, it looks like this. Uh, I gotta imagine the hookup in Third Rate Romance, though, looked more like this. <laughs> like, it's, just, it's really like a patronizing song. Like, in both versions, the singer just seems just amused at how crappy it is. Then he went to the desk and made his request while she waited outside. The chintzy hotel bar music doesn't make this sound any hotter. I constantly hear your songs about picking up chicks at the club, but this is clearly happening at some crappy dive bar lounge. She kept saying, I've never really done this kind of thing before. Have you? I can't imagine the sex was anything to write home about either. Number three. You know, I told myself I wasn't gonna put any comedy songs on here, but you know what, just go with it. Look around the room, I can tell the you of the most beautiful girl in the room. I don't really have any commentary except that these guys are damn funny. And when you're on the street, depending on the street, I bet you were definitely in the top three. 
and I bet if they used that line on that girl in real life, it would actually work. This is some serious serenading material right here. You know that scene in Say Anything, where John Cusack serenades a girl with In Your Eyes, one of the most romantic songs ever written? Well, guess what? In that movie, that move didn't get him jack. But if he had played some Flight of the Concords... You're so beautiful. Beautiful. You could be a waitress. Bam! Sex. You want to know why? Because girls like funny guys. I mean, look at me. I'm a semi-professional internet comedian. And my OKCupid okay profile has gotten a whopping three comments almost. You could be a part-time model. You probably still have to keep your normal job. And judging by the rest of the Flight of the Concord songs, I assume they're probably gonna have pretty mundane sex too. Make it love for two minutes. And that to me, ladies and gentlemen, is love. That I'm sharing a kebab with the most beautiful girl I have ever seen with a kebab. Number two. Say this about Meatloaf, man. He doesn't do anything half-ass. And I never had a girl looking any better than you did. When he sings about teenage romance, what do you think he's gonna sing? Night moves? <laughs> Hardly. He's gonna sing an eight-minute multi-part epic that ends with him stuck in a loveless marriage. So now I'm praying for the end of time. And that's not the song I picked for this, it's just a good example of the Loaf's dedication to these giant emotions. Hell, he doesn't even look for missing art supplies without putting his all into it. I bought those mother sponges! Part of that pain is mine! I'm sick and tired! I admire that. Meatloaf goes all out, like a bat out of hell. Even when he makes a song that lands on this list. Meatloaf's 2 out of 3 ain't bad is probably the most passionate of the songs on this list. He very, very passionately does not love you. He is driven to the very height of heart-rending emotion by his lack of love for you. It's just heartbreaking. A lot of guys are just like, love him and leave him, but Meatloaf can't find it in him to do either of those things. Apparently this was an attempt by Meatloaf songwriter Jim Steinman to write a simple love song inspired by a very romantic Elvis song. But it turns out that he didn't have a simple love song in him, just as much as there ain't no Coupe de Ville hiding in the bottom of a Cracker Jack box. Love that line. To be fair, this is pretty close to the simplest song on the album, not to mention just an amazingly good goddamn song, but a love song, it is definitely not. Yeah, I can't front, I absolutely love this song. But when I think of mediocre romance, there's one song that can top even the loaf. Wanna know what it is? Let's find out. Well, not really, but you're good enough for now. Number one. And when I put this list together, I knew instantly that this song was going to be my number one. Because this song isn't just about a mediocre relationship, it's a mediocre song. It's, it's, it's not even that, it's the embodiment of mediocrity. Salieri eating a white bread sandwich with Kraft cheese and store brand mayonnaise couldn't be this mediocre. I mean this sincerely. I have never seen a song this impressively meh. What could it be? Well, I got three words for you. Deep. Blue. Something. You'll say we've got nothing in common. 
Breakfast at Tiffany's is one of those lyrical conceits that's kind of so lame that you can't even imagine why it exists, but you can't help but be delighted that it does. It's about a guy whose relationship is failing because he and his girl don't have anything in common. But then he turns it all around with this unforgettable chorus. And I said, what about breakfast to Tiffany? She said, I think I remember the film. And as I recall, I think we both kind of liked it. And I said, well, that's the one thing we got. Of course! What we have in common is a classic Audrey Hepburn movie that we both only kind of remember and only mildly liked. Maybe. Truly one of the most impassioned defenses of love ever written. This song describes the saddest, most uninspiring relationship I think I have ever heard in a song. Funny thing is that the song could have worked if they played the whole we have this movie in common thing like it was a resigned bitter joke, the same way two out of three ain't bad is. But obviously that's not how they play it at all. It's like this half-assed stab at a soaring chorus like Wait a minute, we have breakfast at Tiffany's! Yes, let's get married and have seven kids! Seriously, at least Rupert Holmes and his lady seem to really like pina coladas. The couple here only just kinda like breakfast at Tiffany's. Like, how were they together at all? A similar taste in movies is just not something to base a relationship on. Hey, that's a perfectly legitimate reason to be together. What about Sleepless in Seattle? We both kinda liked that. I hated Sleepless in Seattle. Well, French Kiss. No. Enchanted? No. He didn't like Enchanted? Sorry. Pan's Labyrinth? Yeah, I like Pan's Labyrinth. You see, there you go, we were meant to be together. Well, as I recall, I kind of like Breakfast at Tiffany's. Did you? I didn't see Breakfast at Tiffany's. Done! Wait, come on! I'm Todd in the Shadows, and I truly, madly, deeply feel okay about this list. Good night! If you want to